would be good. Good. It's recording. Welcome everyone to our uh, Zoom church service. And we're going to be discussing some things from the Bible that are probably relevant for us at this time. Thank you. Uh, at this present time, we are members of the church militant. Mm -hmm. We are not yet members of the church triumphant. Mm -hmm. Not walking through the pearly gates. We still have a way to go. Mm. And the word militant comes from the word military. So the people in the church are likened to soldiers in the military. Mm. Uh, not the military in terms of uh, guns and bombs and tanks. We're not fighting with those things, of course. Mm. As Ephesians chapter, 12, uh, chapter 6 verse 12 says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness. So we are soldiers in a spiritual conflict. You know, we fight against error. We fight against sin. Uh, this is our battle. Uh, all the while we're promoting Bible truth, the morality of God's law, this is our battle. Okay. But... When the, the battle is won, we have the victory, we become the church triumphant. And I want to read that verse about the church triumphant. It's in Revelation chapter 15, verse 2. This is, this is the church triumphant. This is what we're aiming for. And it says there, Revelation 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So these are the overcomers in like heaven, whatever. You know, notice they've got the victory, victory over the beast, over the image, over his mark and his number. So they've been through the battle and gained the victory. Uh, one of the greatest enemies there of the church militant is mentioned. It's this uh, beast, symbolic beast of Revelation 13, verse 1. Let's look there. You have this, this beast in Revelation 13, and he has these heads. And as we learned the other week, remember, the head of a person is the governing part of the body, the head. Therefore, these heads represent governments. We, Brother Andrade explained that. Yeah. Government. Mm. And notice on the heads is written the name of blasphemy. These are blasphemous governments. <laughs> and blasphemy has to do with religion. So this, this uh, beast... It depicts a form of government that is blasphemous against God. And verse 5 and 6 says that. He speaks out of his mouth blasphemies. That's verse 5. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. So this is a, a government, a worldly government that's against God. And verse uh, 7 says they make war against the saints. So this is a government that engages in religious persecution, a worldly mm. government. Now, this situation developed in the past because the church did not confine herself to moral and spiritual things. No, the church engaged in statecraft. They, they employed the powers of governments to, for her purposes to, you know, persecute religious dissenters. That's what happened. The church got into the governments of the world and persecuted anyone who didn't agree with them. And uh, notice the devotees of this persecuting church. Verse 4, it says they worship the dragon and then it says they worship the beast. It has religious overtones. 
So this is the, the, the power that the church militant has to struggle against. And then in verse 11, you have the image of the beast of the Revelation 13, mm. another symbolic beast. It's called the image of the beast. And again, a, a church that gets into worldly governments and it becomes uh, like the very image of the other beast, if you like. And then, uh, notice in uh, Revelation 13, verse 12, the devotees of this uh, this religion, they worship the first beast, uh, you know, the one that persecutes. And it also persecutes because in verse uh, 15 it says uh, uh, there that anyone that would not worship, what would they do? They would mm. seek to kill them, even to the point of killing them. Mm. And verse 16 and 17 says it enforces the mark of the beast. I don't want to go into depths with that today, but we, we, are, we understand the mark of the beast. Some people think the mark of the beast is a computer chip implanted in the mind, you know, mm. to make the person into a zombie to control the person. <laughs> but the mark of the beast has to do with religion, mm. and religion likes to control the person, right? That's what it has to do with. A controlling religion, a persecuting religion, do our religion or else we'll, we'll put you to death or we'll persecute you. You know, and these persecuting religions, they have institutions which they like to force upon us. And uh, this is where the mark comes in the mind, where people believe in it. Or in the hand when they go go along with it out of convenience. Let's read in Revelation 14, verse 9, where God warns us. <clears throat> God is warning us here. So this is our battle as the church militant. Revelation 14, verse 9, this is a message from the third angel. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship, this is religion, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, etc. It goes on. And verse 11 warns us. It says there, not to worship the beast in his image and not to receive the mark. Again, it's all about worship. Who will we worship? God is warning us not to join in the worship of these ones. Don't go along, even if they persecute us. This is our battle. And then in verse 14 says, uh, of, uh, I don't know, verse 12, sorry. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that, that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. This calls for patience. Patience be required because we may suffer persecution. We may, we may need to resist state authorities trying to force upon us false religion and worship we don't agree with when we would rather uphold the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is the battle we have to fight. Uh, this, this is the third angel's message of Revelation 13. So it's describing a religious conflict involving us. Not many churches these days profess to keep the commandments of God anymore. You know, not in their original form. Most churches have given up the original Sabbath day, God's holy day that he established in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2, also part of the Ten Commandments. But we profess to be the commandment-keeping people of God described in Revelation 14, verse 12, you know, the church militant. <clears throat> But like if you think of a conflict, a military conflict, say the conflict going, over, going on in, in Ukraine with you know, fighting against Russia, many soldiers fall, many soldiers die in a conflict. 
in a religious conflict, many people fall. They don't fall, uh, you know, maybe they're not shot with guns or bullets, but many people fall because they give up. They surrender. They surrender the truth. And this is the same case in this, this battle we're fighting under the third angel. Do you know what it says in Great Controversy? In the book Great Controversy about this conflict, page 608. It says uh, a large class, a lot of people who profess the third angel's message, these people that are profess to be commandment keepers, a large class give up. Mm. It says they abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Mm. Many people will give up. Why do they give up? It says it in the same page. It says because they, they become more and more worldly. They unite with the world and they've not been sanctified by the truth. And so when the pressure comes, they give up in the battle. The pressure of the battle is too much and they join. They surrender. They wave the white flag. We'll join with you. Have you ever read in early writings, the book Early Writings, page 36 or so, you see there is written there is a, a, a group of people crying in, in agony. Why are they crying in agony? It says um, they realize they're lost because, and I'll read a quote here, it says, these are they who have once kept the Sabbath, they kept God's commandments, and have given it up. They surrender. They wave the white flag. They have trodden underfoot the Sabbath, and they are weighed in the balance and found wanting. So, in this conflict we read in Revelation chapter 14, we believe many will surrender, many will give up. And the ones getting more and more worldly, they will give up. Um, that's why it says you need to have patience. That word is not put there for no reason. Patience to maintain the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is our admonition. Patience to resist the beast and his image. I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Right. Let's go on. Let us talk about the story in 1 Samuel chapters 2, 3, and 4. This story, I believe, is a type of the church militant in the last days. It's a type. So... Maybe this story will help us understand why such a large class, why so many people surrender. They give up the commandments. Maybe this story will, will help us to understand why, why do all, so many people give up in the last days in this battle? We think, oh, we think, oh, the majority of people will stand faithful, but I don't think so. <laughs> Here, this read what happened in First Samuel. Let's turn over the page there, chapter two. Mm. You know, it's nice to boast and think, "Oh, you're so strong and powerful that you won't give up the truth." But you know, we are only human beings. Under pressure, we don't know what we'll do. Let us read in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. And it talks about Eli's sons. It says they were sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. Mm. They were priests, but they were ministers in Israel, you know, church ministers. <laughs> and it says they knew not the Lord. Mm. It's okay to have, you know, be a priest in the church but they didn't know god and verse 17 says wherefore the sin of the young men these are eli's sons was very great before the lord for uh, men aboard the offering of the lord um i know in the other bible it says that these men eli's sons treated the lord's offering with contempt 
Mm. They didn't care about the sacrifices mm-hmm. they were making. And verse 22 also says that Eli's sons uh, lay with the women that assembled at the door. They were committing fornication with the women that came to worship at the sanctuary, at the tabernacle. What did Eli do about it? Verse 24, he says, Nay, my sons, uh, for it is no good report that I hear you make the Lord's people to transgress. This is what he did. So Eli remonstrated with his sons. You're doing the wrong things, my sons. But he didn't take further action. Mm. He didn't punish them. He didn't set things in order. He permitted them to remain in church office. Mm -hmm. And their corrupting influence remains upon the people. The sin of Eli was his inaction. And a man of God came to Eli with a message from God here in chapter 2, verse 29. Uh, this is a man of God. God sent a man to him. Um, at verse 27, I think it talks about, and there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, etc. I'm going to say all the rest, but let's read verse 29. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice? And at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy, thy sons above me, and ye make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. So here's a man of God rebuking Eli. Eli had this warning message from, from God. Also from the child Samuel, you know, the little when Samuel was there also, the Lord sent a message to Samuel in the night that he was going to uh, punish Eli for what he was doing. He mm. wasn't taking action. And in chapter 3, verse 13, it says this. Uh, um for I have told him that I will judge his house. This is Eli's house. This is uh, mm. forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. So this was the message that Samuel was gave to Eli. Because Eli pressed Samuel to tell him what the Lord had said. He was only a child. Mm. Tell me, what, what did the Lord say to you in the night? And so Samuel, being a little child, he told him everything in verse 18. But still, Eli did not remove his sons from church office. He didn't remove them. They stayed as ministers in the church. And then in verse uh, 1 Samuel um, 3, verse 13, Eli says this, um, Oh, no, so I got the wrong verse, have I? Um, yeah, no, sorry, I've got the wrong verse. Is it 14? <clears throat> anyway, Eli um, <clears throat> says, let the Lord do what seemeth good to him. Now, yeah, I have got the wrong verse. Uh, let me see. So the message comes to Samuel, and then he gets it out of Samuel. It must be in 14. Four. Anyway, let's get it. I lost that verse. So Eli, Eli said, well, let the Lord do, do what seemeth good to him. So, I mean, Samuel told him, but he didn't take any action. That was the point. Anyway, so when we profess to keep God's commandments, you know, we are guardians of the ark of God in this modern day. You know, Eli was the, the priest, the guardian of the ark, guardian of the commandments in the, the ark and the sanctuary, you know. We need to live up to our profession. Eli didn't. So what happens next in chapter 4, verse 3? Now, I hope I've got these chapters right. Yes. <clears throat> now, let's read that. It says, And when the people were come 
into the camp. The elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us this day before the Philistines? They said, Oh, we, we, we're losing the battle. They came into a, a conflict with the Philistines. So they said, Let us fetch the ark of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, mm -hmm. that it may come among us, and it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. They said, Go get the ark of the covenant. That'll save us. We're in this mm. conflict. But the battle did not go well. You know the story. They, Israel lost the battle. And 30,000 men of Israel were slain. And verse 11 says it's a terrible thing that happens. And the ark of God was taken. They took it, the Philistines. Mm. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So they lost the battle. And all this happened here in verse 15. And it says, Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. So he was a very old man. And when the news came to Eli, uh, news of the battle, the messenger said this in verse 17. And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great slaughter among the people. Phineas are dead. Hophni and Phineas are dead. And the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he fell, this is Eli, from off the seat backward by the side gate and his neck brake and he died. For he was an old man and heavy and he judged Israel 40 years. At the same time, the wife of Phineas, one of Eli's sons, she died as well. Mm. And look at the verse in verse 21. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel because the ark of God is taken. That's interesting. As Seventh-day Adventist people, we have always considered ourselves people of the ark, the ark containing the Ten Commandments. You know, we have the sanctuary message, don't we? Guardians of the sanctuary message. And we follow Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the sanctuary where the commandments are. But what would happen if the glory departed from the church militant? What about modern Israel? We are in a spiritual battle, yes. Will we lose the, the ark of God as they did? You know, in the spiritual sense I'm talking, I don't know if you understand. Well, let us connect another passage from the Bible, Ezekiel chapter 9. This is a prophecy. This is actual prophecy about the church militant. In, in the last days, Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. Could we lose the Ark of the Covenant from? <laughs> Could we be like ancient Israel? Let us read in uh, Ezekiel 9 verse 4. I'm going to connect this verse in. This is actual prophecy. Now I've got the book of Ezekiel. Now 9. Let's turn that page up. Here in 9 verse 4, and it says, And the Lord said unto me, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. This is figurative of God's church. Midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So this represents the church of God in the last days. It's called Jerusalem in a figurative sense. Jerusalem, God's city. His church. And notice the mark is set on the foreheads of the men sighing and crying for the abominations done in the church. And this was like the man of God that rebuked Eli, that came to Eli, and he cried against the abominations done by the sons of Eli. He says, your sons do terrible. Yeah. Like young Samuel even, who, who did not withhold his message from Eli. 
And look what happens to these old guardians of the sanctuary, just like Eli. Verse 9, verse 6. Chapter 9, verse 6, I should say. It says, Slay utterly the old and the young, both maids and little children, and women, but come not near any man upon whom the mark is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. And they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Notice, this is like the story of Eli. Mm -hmm. Judgment began with the ancient men of the sanctuary. Eli was an ancient man of the sanctuary, 98 years old, guardian of the sanctuary. When the judgment of God came upon him, because he was a fat man and he didn't restrain his sons. Hmm. The ark of God was taken. Is this possible in a modern sense? It seems to prophesy that there in Ezekiel. In Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, that's a chapter titled The Seal of God. Uh, page 207, there's a chapter titled The Seal of God you know, or The Mark, like these men that are sighing and crying. And it's also, it's also talks about the ancient men, and the ancient men. So um, that chapter there, Fifth Testimonies, you, you read it later. It says the ancient men, what was wrong with these ancient men? Those whom God had given great light who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people, had betrayed their sacred trust, just like Eli. He betrayed his sacred trust. He didn't, he, he didn't act as guardians. He left his sons there to prey on the people, to do their sins, to fornicate with the women and to corrupt the sacrifice. Eli did nothing. And they say, and it goes on to say, and they say, the Lord will not do good, neither will evil. The evil. The Lord is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. Thus, peace and safety is the cry. Peace and safety. The Lord will not do anything. It goes on to say, these dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. You read that in uh, <clears throat> Fifth Testament, page 211. So Eli was like a do dumb dog. You know, he wouldn't remove his sons from church office. And further in the testimony, we read about those who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the church, a bit like Samuel. Uh, some in the church repented because of the sighing and crying, but the majority did not. And, and in the same Testimony, it says, the glory of the Lord departed from Israel. And that's talking about modern Israel, not ancient Israel. Mm -hmm. It says in Fifth Testimonies, the glory of the Lord departed. You know, same as the story of Levi. I mean, Levi. Same as the story of Eli. Mm -hmm. And that's the end of the church militants described in Ezekiel chapter 9, prophetically. And at that stage, we will need to be part of the church triumphant. We will need to be. We need to have the victory over the beast and his image and his mark and not go with the large class of people that abandon the truth. So we see, is the situation the same today? We've talked all about Eli and his sons. When we read the historic position of the church, the church has history. We need to read the history of the Seventh-day Adventist people. They have history on the marriage stand, the marriage vow. It was never optional in the old days. You turn away to find a new partner, you know, turn away from your marriage to find a new partner. Your marriage vow was not optional. You would be disfellowshipped from the church. Mm -hmm. 
Remember E.J. Wagner? He was a great minister of the church, you know. Shouldn't disfellowship him, right? Great minister, preacher of righteousness by faith. I want to read what happened to Wagner. This is, comes from what became of E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. I don't know if you have the article or the book, but anyway, it says, it says in 1906, Elder Wagner and his wife had, Elder Wagner, after his wife had divorced him because of his attentions to a nurse with whom he had become acquainted in England, uh, Wagner married the lady, says. His wife divorced him because he gave attention to a nurse. He was a doctor and he fell in love with someone else. <laughs> and then it goes on to say, this, of course, terminated his connection with the church. He was no longer a pastor, no longer a minister in the church. Mm. He was out. That's the historic position of the church. Mm. Now, okay, so he helped the church afterward. Maybe he could be saved outside the church, but he was not a member. He never stood again in the pulpit of the church. Mm -hmm. Today, marriage vows are nothing. Easy come, easy go, you know. <laughs> Pastor gets divorced. The next minute he's got a new wife. He's back in the pulpit. No worries. Oh, God doesn't see. Mm -hmm. But this, to God, it's like the sons of Eli. Mm -hmm. The same with Sabbath keeping in this modern day. We read the historic position of the church about Sabbath keeping. Today, it's just anything goes. Oh, you've got to, you've got to earn a living. You've got to work on the Sabbath day. Oh, you just got to. <laughs> well, if you're breaking it now, you're going to break it when the <laughs> later, aren't you? The historic position of the church on Sabbath keeping is really important. Uh and, and what about all the things that the people were doing on that day now? We're becoming more and more worldly. You know? It's become like a sports day. You remember the sermon I preached about sports Sunday and sports Sabbath. Do what you like kind of thing. Day of recreation, even though the commandment says different. Yes, that's what we have. In these last days, a love in one class of people Love for the divine, for the God's law is increasing with another class of people. The contempt for God's law is increasing. We have the two classes of people. Mm. The ark of God remained in Shiloh for 300 years. 300 years, a long span of time. Mm. But because of the sins of the house of Eli and it fell into the hands of the Philistines, Shiloh was ruined. You know, the ark was never returned there. It never was returned to the tabernacle there. It was transferred to the temple in Jerusalem. And Shiloh fell into ruin, insignificance, nothing there anymore. The ruins only mark the spot where it once stood. And the fate of Shiloh is, was used as a warning to Jerusalem where the ark went. And God said he would do the same thing to Jerusalem if God's people are corrupt in Jeremiah 7, verse 12. So the same warning was to Jerusalem. And guess what? The same thing happened, you know, when the Babylonians came. In Jeremiah 7, the ark was taken. No, no, it wasn't taken. It was hidden by Jeremiah, but mm -hmm. the, the temple was destroyed. Yep. But the ark was also, um, you know, hidden. Hidden, yeah, apparently mm. hidden, I believe. Here in um, <clears throat> Jeremiah 7, verse 12, it says here, there's a warning, warning from Jeremiah. It says, But go ye now unto my place, which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at first, and see what I did to, to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. So Shiloh was decimated. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, go and have a look. See what happened there. It's gone. And then in verse 12, he says, uh, verse 13, he says, uh, but now because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, and I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, and ye heard not, and I called you, but ye answered not. 
Therefore will I do unto this house, this is the temple in Jerusalem, I will do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, unto the place which I have gave you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And sure enough, he did the same. The temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, and they all went into captivity to Babylon because they were unfaithful. They are God's people. They are, you know, God's profession, commandment-keeping people, and look what happened to them. <clears throat> in Fourth Testimony, page 166, it says the sin of Eli in passing lightly over the iniquity of his, of his sons who were uh, occupying sacred offices. This was the sin of Eli. The sin was lightly regarded and allowed to remain among them. So when do you think God will intervene? When sin is lightly regarded in his church, when we don't deal with it. And we think, oh, turn a blind eye. It goes on to say, the Israel thought that the presence of the ark would give them victory against the Philistines, whether they had repented or not. They did not repent of their sins. They had the ark. They were the professed commandment giving people. But it didn't save them. Because they did not repent and do the right thing. The people thought their association, you know, we could think the same today. You know, our association with the commandment keeping people, that'll save us, that'll save us. And God will overlook our sins. We need to repent. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say in that testimony, the same danger exists today. Uh, People think that the commandments will preserve them from the power of divine justice, you know, because we have commandment keepers on our profession, on our church. But we need to be put, we need to put sin out of the camp. It goes on to say there are serious consequences. The desolation of Jerusalem stands as a solemn warning to uh, modern Israel, it says there in that testimony. It stands as a warning. So does so the decimation of Shiloh and the decimation of Jerusalem under the Babylonians are warnings to us. Unfortunately, we see the church is converted, not to Christ, is converted to the world. Um, because I guess the longer time goes on, the time drags and pe people forget. People forget how the church was in the past. And uh, it's like the zeitgeist, you know, the spur of the age has kind of affected the church. And uh, people don't realize where the church is drifting. People have forgotten how it was in the past, the ancient institutions, and, and they see nothing wrong. But if we study the early Adventist church, how did they keep the Sabbath day, God's holy day? The early Adventist church, how did they deal with marriage, adultery, divorce? How did they do it? We have the books. We have the history. We can read it. How did they deal with the bearing of arms during the American Civil War? The history is there in the 1860s. They disfellowshipped those who bore arms. It might even seem like a just war that they had. The opposite took place in World War II. We know the opposite. What, what happened? Those who, who didn't bear arms were disfellowshipped. The opposite. Mm. They wanted to appease Hitler. Oh, appease Hitler. So the standard changed. We're not to be engaged in uh, you know, wars and military. I want to close with a few more texts and then we'll we'll finish. I thought one was good in the lesson. What was it I read today? Uh, the one in Peter, 2 Peter 2, verse 21. It says, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than 
after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. You know, it's okay to profess to keep the commandments, but to turn away from the commandments is better you never knew. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11 says this. Ecclesiastes 8 verse 11. It says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. When the church does not deal with church officers or people in the church that are sinning and they treat it, with, they treat it light, it sets a precedent and um, people are, are more inclined toward doing evil. Like Eli's sons, they were not speedily punished. They were not you know, put out of church office. They got away with it. And uh, the people become hardened and uh, dull. And, uh, and then... Because uh, God doesn't intervene immediately, they, 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 they drift on. But one day these things will be judged by the standard. And what is the standard? The standard by which the people of the church militant will be judged is God's moral law. Mm. It's the Ten Commandments. How valuable is the Ten Commandments to you? You know, is the Sabbath day, precious to you. Is that time precious? You know, I think a whole day with God, awesome. <laughs> um, to study his word, to spend time with uh, God's people, awesome. Or is that distasteful? I don't know. Maybe we're far from God if it's distasteful. Of course. Yeah. But if we love God, we would love to spend time with him. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's what we need to do in these last days, not just have a profession, an outward profession that can go away under, under the pressure of persecution. It needs to be right in our hearts no. because we have this, this incredible um, battle, we have the whole world against us just about, you know, all the churches have given up the commandments just about, and they hate us because we keep them or profess to keep. So it's going to create a lot of pressure upon us. And so it needs to be valuable, precious to us, that we resist and stand for the truth. Amen. Amen. Mm.